Praise the Lord. I wonder if you could be turning with me to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 17. Is this one off now? Is this one off now? Matthew chapter 17. You know, it's interesting that that chorus, uh, or the main part of the chorus, said, uh, Nothing from you I withhold. I wonder if that's true today. Is Jesus truly your Lord? Is he truly your Saviour? You know, I sometimes wonder if we've forgotten how to worship. If we've truly forgotten how to forget ourselves and lose ourselves in worshipping Jesus. You know, it's, and I can understand because, you know, it's, it's so easy to be afraid of falling into heresy that we end up doing nothing. And forgetting that we have a living, vibrant Holy Spirit dwelling within us that wants to get out, that wants to praise the living God. And isn't that why we're here? To lift Him and praise Him. To glorify his name. To lift him up high above all earthly things. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Release welcome. Release welcome. Matthew 17, verse 1. That's nothing to do with what I'm going to speak about today, by the way. Absolutely nothing. Matthew 17, verse 1. I'm going to read to verse 13. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James and John, his brother, and bringeth them up to a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, or Elijah, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto the Lord Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou will, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias, or Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first, and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them let's bow our hearts and heads and pray close our eyes and pray Father we thank you for your word thank you for the truth of your word and for your eternal truth that is locked within its precious words We, we lift them to you today Lord and we ask you to use these words to grant us wisdom and discernment and understanding of your will and your ways. Help us to grow in you, Lord. And to be more like your Son, the Lord Jesus. For in whose name we ask it. Amen. Amen. So what we've read has always seemed to me, I don't know about you, it's always seemed a very clear message, hasn't it? The, the Mount of Transfiguration. The appearing of Moses and Elijah. And God pronouncing 
This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. It was a proclamation, wasn't it, of God confirming the ministry of his son. And that's true. It's a clear message. It's showing us uh, the meaning of something, isn't it? Who Jesus is, who he was and who he is. And yet there's an unmistakable message that he was and is the Messiah. That's the one true clear message in that scripture, isn't it? However, there's something else there as well. And it's something that I want us to look at today. And it's, it's something that's kind of confirms something that's been stirring in my, in my heart for, for some time. Uh, about Elijah. I've been looking a lot at Elijah and his ministry and, and what that means for us today. Elijah, or as the Greek has it, Elias. Elijah has a lot to teach us today as we'll see hopefully as we go on. However, we're going to be looking today at mainly at Elijah, but Elijah and Moses. Have you ever wondered why it was that God chose Elijah? Have you ever stopped and thought why God specifically chose Elijah along with Moses to be there on the top of Mount Hermon? Something that had never come into my mind until the Lord popped it there over this last week or so. We know why Moses was there. Moses represents the Lord, doesn't he? Moses the lawgiver. And we know that Through that appearance, it was telling the disciples, here is my son, he is the fulfilment of what Moses brought. He is the fulfilment of what Moses prophesied and and brought to you as the people of Israel. He is the fulfilment, the living embodiment of the law. We know that, don't we? I hope we know that. But why did he choose Elijah? Elijah. In Judaism, Moses has always been acknowledged as as the figurehead, as it were. He was the lawgiver and he was the the main man, if you like, in Judaism. Even in Jesus' day, they looked to Moses and they still do as the main figure in, in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. He was the lawgiver, but he's also a prophet, isn't he? The prophet Moses. But God specifically drew Elijah there onto that Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Hermon. The Lord's represented by Moses and the prophets are represented by Elijah. I don't know about you, but I found this really interesting because I'd never stopped and thought, hang on a minute, there were lots of prophets. There were lots of prophets in the Old Testament. Some even greater or more well known, let's say, Then Elijah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Haggai, Zechariah. All great prophets, all men that God used to bring his message to his people. But why Elijah? What exactly is God saying through his choice, and especially to us, of why Elijah was there representing the prophets? Of course, the clear message, as I've said, is that Jesus is proclaimed to be the Son of the living God, Yahweh, God himself. And God himself proclaimed it. Matthew 17, verse 5 says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. God clearly defining and confirming who Jesus was and who he is. It's unmistakable, but there's also another message here. And that's what Jesus was to represent himself. Who and what Jesus was and is. What his character 
what its nature was to be and how that would be reflected in his ministry. We all know, I hope we do by now, that Jesus came to fulfil the law. I'm not going to go into all that today. We've been there, we've done that. Worn the t-shirt. But we know that he fulfilled the law and he is the living embodiment and fulfilment of those Ten Commandments. Isn't he? You agree? Yeah. And in him, we also fulfil it. Because we are part of him. We don't have to go there again. We know this. It stands as as red as it were. However, there's much more. And it, it involves the reason Elijah's there. The law represented the standards or the demands that God demands to be in his presence. Amen? They're his standards and they're high. Man alone could never attain to them. Only through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's much more involved. Matthew 7, verse 12 and 13 say this. Therefore all things whatsoever you would that man should do to you do you even unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40, say this. Matthew 22, if you're writing it down. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Luke 24, verse 44 to 47, say this. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Something that's not preached very often today, isn't it? We're sinners. We need saving. We need a saviour. The world needs a saviour. And his name is Jesus. He and he alone is the answer for the nations. We know well that the law was and is a schoolmaster pointing us to the one who's fulfilled it, but also through whom we are also seen by God as fulfilling it. I've already said that, haven't I? So what then is the other message? What is this other message besides what Moses represents, what Jesus represents, if you like, as a fulfilment of what Moses represents? It's a tongue full, isn't it? But what does Elijah mean? What is his presence there? What is fulfilled? What is being represented here by the presence of Elijah on the mount? And why is he representing the prophets? What does this mean about Jesus and what does this mean about us? Well, as I've said, there were many prophets in the history of Israel. Many great prophets. In fact, they were all great prophets all godly men whether we call them minor or major it makes no difference the only difference is the amount that they wrote Isaiah and Ezekiel wrote more so they're called greater prophets that's the only difference they all brought the message of the living God to his people so why Elijah what is it that singles him out in God's eyes what, what is it about Elijah or his ministry that was important enough to warrant 
his appearance on the Mount of Transfiguration. Surely the single most notable act of Elijah was his challenge of the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Coincidentally or not coincidentally enough, the very, almost the very place where Jacob is today. In fact, the spot, traditional spot, is about six kilometres from where Jacob's staying, just a little further along the, the Carmel mountain range at Machraka. This was the single most. Elijah did many things. God did many things through Elijah. But this is the one single most powerful thing that is remembered, isn't it, of Elijah. Challenging the prophets of Baal on the top of the mountain. Greatly outnumbered he was. He stood against everyone. But he stood for the Lord. This stands out really both to the Jew and to the Gentile believer. Elijah's God is the God that answers by fire. Isn't that what we all remember? God that answers by fire. Fire came down and consumed the sacrifice and the altar and the water that surrounded it. God truly confirmed he was in the face of rejection and disbelief. Nevertheless, let's go on. It was possibly the most physical, practical and public display of the reality of who God is, what God is. Displaying his awesome power outside that of the parting of the Red Sea, of course. Nevertheless, what does it mean in the context of of our text today, Matthew? The appearance of Elijah on the mount. Let's have a look at how the idea of Elijah is used in other scriptures to give us some kind of idea. Let's turn to Matthew 11, if you will. If you've got your Bible with you, turn with me. If you haven't got your Bible with you, why haven't you got it with you? If you're using your wife, that's fine. Matthew 11, verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Who was speaking that? Jesus. Matthew 17, verse 10 to 12. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed or whatever they liked. Likewise, also shall the Son of Man suffer of them. Turn with me to Luke 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 55 to 56. There are quite a few verses, I've just chosen a few, that speak about Elijah in the New Testament. Luke 9, verse 54. 54 sorry. When his disciples, as Jesus disciples. James and John saw this. They said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? But he, that's Jesus, turned and rebuked them and said, you know what manner, not, sorry, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy man's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. It should be apparent, I think. One thing that should be apparent from the reading of those just few scriptures there 
that it wasn't actually the person of Elijah that was the essence of the message. Elijah was a man, wasn't he? But it's more the spirit of Elijah. The character or nature of Elijah, the the way that God moved through him, what he did through Elijah, that is the message. The same is true if you think about it with Moses. Moses was a man, a fallible man. All the prophets, all the prophets were fallible men. It's what God did through them that is the important thing to remember. It's more about the way that God worked through him because some of these scriptures that we've just read are obviously speaking about John the Baptist, aren't they? He's already come, Jesus said. And they didn't know it. And they did whatever they wanted to do to him. Jesus specifically referring about John the Baptist and using the image of Elijah who would come before to prepare the way. So what am I saying? What am I saying? (laughs) (laughs) What I'm saying here is that the image of Elijah, the way that God moved through Elijah, his ministry let's say, the, the crux, the core of his message of his ministry rather is the emphasis here. And his presence on the mount was meant to convey to the disciples the fact that Jesus was also here to be a visible challenge to all that was false. He was and is the truth. I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to God but by me. Not by me, by Jesus. Isn't that what scripture says? Just as Elijah was a direct challenge to King Ahab and his Queen Jezebel for their deceptive governance of Israel, for leading them into apostasy, for leading them into heresy. So was Jesus. An affront to King Herod. John the Baptist prepared the way. As, or in the spirit of Elijah, Jesus carried on that work and fulfilled it to the utmost. Scripture says that he made a show of them openly, his enemies at the cross, triumphing over them in it. Jesus was a direct challenge to Satan and his deception. And so are we to be. Just as Elijah was a challenge to the priests of Baal and the other false religions, so was Jesus against the corrupt priesthood of Jerusalem. He told them that they had made void the law by their tradition. Because the heart of the law is love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your might and your neighbour as yourself. Isn't it? They'd forgotten that. But Jesus was a visible challenge to that. To the established religious order. And just as Elijah was a challenge to the false and empty religion around him and to the false gods on Mount Carmel, so was Jesus in and through his atoning work on the cross. Wasn't he? If you like, he was saying to the devil, kill me. I'll still win. And he did. He gave up his life. Nobody took it from him. He gave it up willingly 
for you. And so how can we how can we sit or how can we stand and not want to praise him with all that we are and all that we have? Isn't he worthy? But you know, Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father. We, his body, are his workmanship here on the earth. We now are the fulfilment of the law. We now are the fulfilment of this challenge that I, Elijah was to the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. We are supposed to be an affront to the things of the devil in this world. We are a direct challenge to his deception because we hold the truth. And our lives should reflect that of the life of Jesus. Jesus, it's a real message, I believe, of Elijah now. Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren, isn't he? That's how scripture describes him. He's the firstborn of many brethren. So then, what was true of Jesus has also to be true of us. Does it not? Our life and our walk should reflect the fact that we are living embodiments of the law. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength and our neighbour as ourself. But also, when we're confronted with heresy, evil, deception, we expose it and bring the truth instead. Isn't that what Jesus did? That's what Jesus did. And that's exactly what we're to do. Elijah stood alone, or so he thought. God had 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. But Elijah didn't know that. Elijah thought he was alone, and he stood alone on Mount Carmel, surrounded by a, a scoffing people, a people who had been led astray, who who didn't care any longer about the altar of the Lord. They didn't care about the things of the Lord. All they were uh, concerned about was themselves. Their own business, their own life. They were happy because they weren't challenged in any way. And the prophets of Baal catered to that. Just like the false religion of our day caters to the selfish self in man. The soul. As long as the soul's happy, people are happy. But God demands something different. He demands something different in us. He demands something higher. And we are to display that higher call. Just like Elijah did. He stood alone, as I've said. Almost where Jacob is now, I've said. And he, in total faith in his God, challenged the prophets of Baal, not just to a debate, but he challenged their God to prove who he was. He said, you do that for your God, and I'll stand for my God, and my God will answer And I want you to think about that right now. Elijah on the top of Mount Carmel. 400 or so prophets of Baal alone without the others that never turned up. The people of Israel who couldn't make up their mind what they were thinking. The king. And I think the queen was back in the palace. But the king was there. And here's Elijah all on his own. But he's not. (laughs) He's not. Because he has all the power of heaven behind him. He burnt his bridges, so so as it were. 
He said, God is either who he says he is or is not. Baal is either who he says he is or he is not. You choose who you're going to follow today. Don't tarry between two opinions. Turn with me to the first chapter of Luke, if you will. Luke chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 11. Luke chapter 1. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and you shall call his name John, or Yohanan in the Hebrew. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall return to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of their fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now we know that that message was about John the Baptist, don't we? But what I want to say today, that message is also about you. It's also about you. You are here to prepare a way for the Lord. You are here to to prepare that way for him to come. You are to prepare yourselves. And we together are to prepare ourselves as the body. In the last verse there, we can see the reason for the choice of Elijah to be alongside Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. It was the spirit of Elijah that was to be present in Jesus. Because it came from Jesus originally to Elijah, didn't it? (laughs) Because Jesus is God. But that same spirit, that same zeal for the house of God, for the word of God, motivated Jesus, caused him to clear the temple of the money changers. And how I would love to do that in some churches today. God, give me courage to do so. But it's this same spirit, this same motivating force that was in Jesus Christ that is to be in you and in me. In the body of Christ because we are his body. We are his likeness. We are his presence on the earth. It's this same spirit that's expected to be found in all those who declare to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you his disciple today? Yeah, the word disciple comes from the word we get discipline from. It isn't a game. It isn't a game. It's a process. We're in a war. We're in a spiritual war. And we have to be prepared to be in that war. We have to be ready. And we have to be prepared for whatever will come against us. What our text is telling us, I believe, amongst other things, obviously, is that Jesus, Yeshua, came, yes, to fulfil the law of Moses and to be the living example of the law, but also he was coming to bring a real choice to the people of this world. If God is real, serve him. If Baal be real, serve him. You can't serve both. 
If God is God, God is real, God is true, serve him. Follow him. Believe him. If not, you're not part of the body. Well, you can't be a part of the body. That's the overwhelming message that I see in this. It was a powerful message to not just the disciples, but to the world. Who and what Jesus was and what he represented because of what was already in the world. The prince of this world, the devil, the enemy of the living God and all his works. The challenge is the same one that Elijah put the people to of his day. Challenge is exactly the same today. Things don't change. God certainly never changes. And there is nothing new under the sun. The same spirits are active today as they were in Jesus' day, the same as they were in Elijah's day and before that. Turn with me, almost finished, but turn with me to 1 Kings 18. A couple of interesting scriptures, almost finished, just a few minutes. 1 Kings chapter 18. Of course, this is the the, the place where we see this great challenge of Elijah to the prophets of Baal. And a challenge also to the people of Israel who were trying to keep a foot in both camps as it were. Trying to believe in God but also keep Baal happy as well, just in case. 1 Kings 18 verse 21 And Elijah came unto all the people, all the people, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? In other words, how long are you going to sit on the fence? If the Lord be God, if Yahweh be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And I want you to underscore, underline what the people said in answer. And the people answered him, not a word. The people didn't have anything to say at this point, because they'd heard it all before, really. Until this next verse. Verse 24. Elijah telling them now what he wants them to do. These prophets. Call ye on the name of your gods... And I will call on the name of the Lord. I will call on the name of Yahweh. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And I want you to underline what it says, the people answered. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. In other words, they'd all said, whoa, it's going to be a fight. Something's going to happen. Either Baal's going to answer by fire or God's going to answer by fire. Something's going to happen. Whoa, we're into this. Let's have a bit of this. People generally like to see proof of what's being proclaimed. That's why we are to reflect the lifestyle of the Lord Jesus Christ when we bring the gospel message. Because if they don't see proof in us, why would they accept our message? This is exactly what Elijah was putting to the people. And this, the answer of God answering by fire, consuming not just the sacrifice, but the sacrifice and the wood, and the stone, and the water that surrounded it. It was proof that God was who he said he was. Proof positive that Yahweh is the only one true living God. And so they were challenged to follow him because he proved who he said he was. 
The ball's now in their court. And so it was, albeit a short-lived one. But the challenge is still the same. And as I said, through Jesus' ministry, it was one of lifelong living proof of God at work. Wasn't it? Isn't it? You look at the, the life of Jesus. Every instance that it talks about what he did, what he said, it was living proof, living vibrant proof that God was alive in him. And was free to move through him. But only because he was totally obedient to God. The point is, however, it's also supposed to be true of his disciples. That's where you and me come in. This, there's a verse in, in James, to, if you want to turn to it, uh, turn with me. James 5, verse 17. James 5, verse 17. <coughs> James 5.17 Elijah was a man subject to like passions of we are. Isn't that a relief? (laughs) He was fallible. He made mistakes. He said and did wrong things. He tripped up occasionally. He was human. He was a man. He was a fallen man. But he prayed earnestly that it might not rain And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. If God could answer a man like Elijah who didn't have the abiding of the Holy Spirit who didn't have the life changing life of the Lord Jesus Christ dwelling in him what can he do through you? What can he do through you? If you'll come before him and pray and seek him. This is the challenge. This is, I believe, I may be wrong, you may have other reasons, but this is why I believe God chose Elijah to be there. Because it was a living active, zealous man of God for God and wherever God's truth was challenged he would speak the truth and God would answer tells me that Elijah had real zeal he had real commitment to God and this reflected in his bold and courageous stand against the king, all the false prophets and a weak and rebellious nation. One man. And God answered by fire. It also tells me that we too as part with the Lord Jesus Christ are to show this same zeal. This same commitment in continuing the work that Jesus began. Greater things than these shall you do. For I go to be with my Father. Didn't Jesus say that? And to do so until his return. Then this same God, this same God that Elijah served, yes, the Holy Spirit would come upon him. But he didn't have what we have. He didn't have an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He didn't have the benefit of being a new creation in Jesus Christ. And yet he stood for God. He prayed and God answered by fire. If we do the same, if we're willing to do the same, if we're willing to commit fully to him, then he once again 
will answer by fire. God bless you.